Also, next we have Jeff Gu. Jeff is the co-founder and policy director of Make Us Visible, a nonprofit empowering local parents, students, teachers, and their neighbors to advocate for the inclusion of Asian American history in the K through 12 curriculum. Welcome, Jeff. Good to see Thank you. you. For having me. Good having me. Absolutely. And Jeff is also one of our new uh, foundation board members to the Government Community College Foundation. So we certainly thank you for your time today. Next, we have Dr. Mahalio Bethe, uh, born and raised in South Bronx, the director of the My Brother's Keeper and My Sister's Keeper initiatives at the New York City Department of Education. Mahalio, welcome. Thank you. It's good to, have, good to be here. Yeah, good to be here. Awesome. And we also have Nikita Saxon, Director for Strategic Initiatives for Admission Services and a Faculty Associate for the new College of Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences at Arizona State University. Welcome, Nikita. Thank you, Dr. Jackson, for having me. Awesome, awesome. So we're going to jump right into our conversation today. Again, if there are any questions uh, that you have, please put those in the chat. And I will do my best to uh, take many of those questions after we go throughout the conversation on today. So I would like to begin the conversation with Mahalio and really begin to talk about, you know, the issues facing our young people. We've seen much that is taking place as recently in my hometown in Florida, as we we're talking about curriculum. Well, and we we're talking about, you know, how do we better support our students, and ensure that they have the knowledge to be successful in the future. But as you begin to think about just the biggest challenges facing young people today, uh, as you consider this polarization of our nation, talk to us a little bit about that. What are those challenges that you're seeing and what might be some strategies that we employ in moving forward? Yeah, thank you. So, you know, <laughs> I, I, I was a history teacher at the beginning of my career. And so like censorship, propaganda, whitewashing, rewriting history, these are all terms that I used to use in my class about 15 years ago to talk about global events. And yet these things are very much so active in the polarization of American thinking in American society. We are seeing an active attempt by lawmakers in cities and states across the country around selected books, certain curriculums, um, and frankly, trying to rewrite or write out um, much of the work that civil rights leaders of the past few decades have fought to illuminate. And so this in and of itself is a challenge, right? Um, young people are watching these events take place. They're watching, literally watching the adults fight. Um, and they're being forced to one, process that, um, and two, um, line that up with their own worth, right? Not only as an individual, but within a certain, you know, group in society, you know, they're forced to ask themselves, why is this taking place? Um, and is this because I'm worth a lot or I'm not worth enough, right? Um, in addition, young people are facing this, um, this issue of access without understanding. Um, we have technology, like these phones are far more advanced than any computer I ever had when I was in high school. And yet for students, for educators, for parents, our understandings around how to even pull unbiased views and understandings from that technology has become really difficult. Um, you know, and that's coupled with fast paced consumption, i.e. Instagram and TikTok and Snapchat and all these other venues. Um, and then these algorithms that determine what I can see on my feed and what I don't see on my feed, right? And so if I like, you know, if I like unicorns, I'm going to see a lot of unicorns, right? Like that's how that works. And, and the same things play out when we talk about politics, when we talk about um, who's feeding us information that we believe to be um, fact versus fiction, et cetera. Our students are struggling to, to know what's real and what's not. And that's not their fault. That's the reality of what technology is giving us. And so, you know, these, these are two of the biggest challenges that I'm noticing. Um, and, and the reality is we have an adult workforce that is also struggling because these things are new for them as well. And so, you know, if, if my students can use the technology better or more effectively than I can, where do I sit in supporting them in those moments? Absolutely, uh, very important points. And, you know, similarly, you know, Jacko, the work that you're doing is so important. And you, I'm sure that you grapple with very similar topics 
So I want to talk more about the work now that is happening in community-based organizations, to which a Brooklyn Pride Center is certainly one. So as a pivotal organization that is amplifying the concerns expressed by the LGBTQIA community, when I think about the pandemic, and you, Mahalio talked about that, the impacts of that, and how students are now so on their phones, and they're, they're more advanced than we are, but when you think about the impact of the pandemic and the role of the Brooklyn Pride Center, talk to us about what were those impacts, and also, how has your leadership changed as a result of the work that you do? Uh, thank, yeah, thank you so much. First of all, uh, I'm honored to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I'd like to start with the second question. How has my leadership style changed? Uh, and for that, I would like to go back to when I came to the United States, which was in, two, which was in 2005. Um, I actually started working uh, soon after I arrived uh, for a Black-run organization. And um, I was um, um, assigned the, um, the role of admi administrative manager of a gallery with a mission to promote and advance uh, the uh, art and artists of the African diaspora. And I recall that during one of the first exhibitions that I managed, um, people came up to me and asked me as a white person, or who put you in this position as a white person, right? Which is a very valid question because I, you know, I'm not of the Af African diaspora and I even don't have an arts history background. So it was a very valid question. My answer back then was, uh, well, I, I function more in the background, right? I do not really directly influence the curatorial, curatorial premise of the uh, gallery uh, and the exhibitions. And at that time, it seemed like on the surface that that answer sufficed, right? But now moving uh, fast forward to the pandemic, uh, which hit in 2020, and uh, uh, was followed soon after um, uh, by the murder of uh, George Floyd. So I went through a period of like self-reflection and uh, relearning. I really thought I had it down, but I was never sufficiently aware of the extent of white, white supremacy in the United States. And also how uh, my own white privilege, white saviorism, white fragility showed up in me, right? Um, and so really realizing that uh, white supremacy is the sea and not the shark, um, it really um, you know, was a hard realization for me. Uh, and it came uh, as a blow to my understanding of anti-racism work and working towards gender equity. It just really emphasized for me the importance of taking on a servant leadership role with increased cultural sensitivity and humbleness. I also learned that language is important, right? Microaggressions are often based, oftentimes based in using harmful language, uh, using the incorrect pronouns uh, of people, and it really makes people feel unsafe. And um, I mean, in this age of polarization and violence against uh, queer people and people of color, uh, we just need to do everything to uh, make people feel safer. Um, and it can start with communicating around a common language, such as person-first language. Um, and by the way, I, I think the societal issues that we're facing now, they have always been there, of course, right? It's just we're, we're now more, perhaps more aware of it. So I'm also wondering um, if that, if, is it more, now that have come more to the service, is that an opening to start working towards solutions? Or does it further the polarization we see all around us? Um, safety is more than just using the right language. We also need to make sure that we have safe and affirming spaces for LGBTQ folks, and we need to give more visibility to the LGBTQ, LGBTQ community as well. Um, for example, if I walk down the street and uh, I'm being arrested or being called names, uh, when I then see a decal in a storefront like a, of, a, of an LGBTQ flag, I just feel a little bit safer, right? Uh, or if I know that around the corner there is an uh, LGBTQ ce center where uh, the staff that works there does not uh, judge me for who I am or how I choose to express myself. The rest of myself is not being addressed, right? But I just feel a little bit safer because there's vis visibility in the areas where I find myself. 
Um, our work has also changed, of course, uh, in terms of uh, virtual platforms, right? Uh, of course, right after the pandemic, we uh, moved to a virtual platform completely. But it also made us really understand that uh, offering virtual services is important to give access uh, to the service that we provide, right? Some people do not want to, are not able to make it to a physical location. And there are several reasons, the cost of transportation, uh, uh, people might be less mobile and have a hard time getting to a center, um, or they just don't want to uh, want to show up uh, at a fiscal because they're you know they might be they might be they might not be out and they feel um, they they don't want to come to uh, a center in person. And um, so it is. Um, it's 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 just very important that we continue to offer virtual services as well, right? And addressing the safety of virtual spaces is also really important. Uh, one of our uh, partners, for example, uh, experiences frequently Zoom bombing, and that's very intrusive, right? And once Zoom bombing occurs, it immediately dissipates the feeling of safety in a supportive environment, right? So, um, just to round this off, like just enabling uh, access to services for all people is top priority, uh, be it in person or virtually. And we have to do that through humbleness and meeting folks where they are in safe and affirming spaces. Love that. And you know, when I think about the, the work that's happening at the uh, Brooklyn Pride Center, the work that's happening with my brother's keeper, my brother and sister's keeper. I think about the work that's also happening at Arizona State University. I recently moved um, from Phoenix, Arizona and had an opportunity to uh, work there part-time and their amazing work is happening. But when I, when I think about the work that Arizona State is doing, it's they're really making a global impact. So Akita, I'm really uh, curious to know when you think about the priorities of the institutions, and preparing this next generation for what we call adulting. What, what are your thoughts about that? And how is Arizona State leaning into preparing the Gen Z population and its current population to be successful as we're now coming out of uh, this uh, COVID-19 pandemic? Um, absolutely. So um, at the core, Arizona State um, is guided by our charter. So, so many institutions have missions and purposes uh, we have established and created a charter that is like our North Star and our guiding light. Um, and a part of our charter um, speaks to assuming fundamental responsibility for um, the cultural, um, social, economic, and overall health of the communities that we serve. And so um, in that, we are really not only preparing our students to take ownership and responsibility for the ASU and the Sun Devil community, uh, but knowing that, that they will be students on our campuses for a short period of time in their life and they are going to go out into um, various communities within the world and understanding that wherever we find ourselves, we must take responsibility. We must um, understand our impact and how we can contribute in those spaces. Um, and so in that way, um, ASU has created um, several different um, initiatives and in, in ways to, to take responsibility for the communities where we find ourselves. Um, and preparing those new leaders, um, that next generation of learners, um, in very meaningful ways. Um, one of those ways is through um, our ASU preparatory academies. And so we have um, created prep um, prep academies across um, the country, really, um, but but specifically um, within the Phoenix Valley um, in those in those areas that that maybe did not have high college going going rates and communities um, that needed that support. Most recently, we opened an ASU a preparatory academy with um, the um, largest and oldest um, African-American church in, in the Phoenix Valley. And so in those ways, we are understanding that we are cultivating um, that new, new generation of learners um, from, from pre-K all the way up until that 12th grade year, um, ready as they, as they matriculate into um, a university setting. And one of the second ways we do that is through Access ASU. And in Access ASU, um, they are some, some grant funded programs, but also some university sponsored programs um, that are censored in um, and stationed in some, some Title I schools across the Valley, um, really making sure that students um, are prepared for whatever next steps those are. We hope that, that that's college, but we understand that some students may not be ready, but how are we meeting students where they are, um, but also helping prepare them and think past um, um, what, what may be their current um, circumstances and situations. Um, secondly, um, admission services, we have completely revamped how we, how we um, 
meet students and the process um, to admissions. And so I'm um, understanding that we spend a lot of time in the school systems as well, working with students, presentations. We also um, know that in preparing the next generation of leaders, of learners, um, we have to reach their teachers. We have to reach their counselors. And so we have connected in meaningful ways. We provide training opportunities, professional development opportunities for counselors um, in that way. Um, some things that we've learned um, in navigating this post-COVID 19 pandemic. I'm not sure if we're post COVID, but but in learning to exist um, in this space now um, is really examining the impacts at every level and taking steps. Uh, one of those ways that we've done that in um, within um, our current student population is that we have spent and for historically focused many years on the first year experience, ensuring that our students have all of the tools and all of the resources that they need to be successful. But what we learned um, that that year after COVID hit is that um, our, our first year students, they spent half of the year virtual, learning in a virtual setting. They did not get that first year experience. And so as we expected, you know, certain, certain learning outcomes for them, competency and skill building in their second year of college, um, they just weren't there. And so we really had to, to think critically on what a sophomore experience could be, what a second year experience could be, how do we continue to support and develop our students there um, because many of them did not receive the, um, the resources and the tools and support that they may have needed in their first year to continue um, the academic success and excellence that, that we are hoping for. Um, another way that we've also done that is, is understanding that our, our students have um, been in a space, if we think about our incoming students for this fall of 23, they have been in a COVID um, environment since ninth grade. And so as we think of how each grade, ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, there are all um, fundamental building blocks um, to support college readiness and preparation um, that we have had to meet students in very different ways and, and work and create programs um, that ensure that our students do have the skills that they need to be successful in a university setting. Um, so a lot of that means creating some bridge programs where we're inviting students to, to engage and take some classes um, over that summer before their first year um, to ensure that they have the study skills, that they know how to reach out and ask for help with some of our academic success programs um, to ensure that they can be successful here. Um, I also say lastly, um, meeting students where they are, um, but also inviting them into our spaces differently. Um, one, we have certainly um, revamped our, our virtual offerings and we continue to offer those now um, whether they be for our students going through the admissions process, but of course our virtual programs for students on campus. Um, but we've also realized that um, we could not return, once we returned to in-person programming, uh, we could not return in the same way. Students and families weren't responsive because their priorities had shifted. And so how do we think critically about the programs that we're offering, um, the equity around those programs and access um, and how do we articulate the meaning and the value of those programs differently um, to entice and to, to, to work with our parents, our families, and our students um, for them to want to come into our spaces? Thank you, Nikita. Jeff, you're on the other side of the spectrum here. So we've heard about the curriculum. We heard about you know, preparing students to be successful. We hear about the community-based organizations and how they're rallying to provide persons with the support that they need, the mental health. Uh, and all of those emotional aspects that make us whole. But the work that you're doing would make us visible is very intriguing to me in that you're looking at the curriculum aspect of the K through 12 students. So your organization, Make Us Visible, it activates and empowers the local communities to build curriculum and advocate for the integration of AAPI contributions, experiences, and histories to K through 12 classrooms. Why today is that such a focus and why is it so critical today? Yes, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Johnson. Thank you, Gottman Community College. And you know, thank you to all the staff for setting up this amazing speaker series. Um, it really is an honor to be a part of this. Um, let me start by talking about why I helped co-found Make Us Visible to start. Um, I just graduated from college about eight months ago um, here from here in New York City. And I remember when I first went off to college, my mom used to call me all the time. You know, are you drinking enough water? Are you eating enough food throughout the day? Are you taking care of yourself as you're going in between classes? Um, and, you know, just making sure that I was doing all right, that I felt safe, that I was, you know, I was taking care of myself. And um, over the last few years, there was a bit of a role reversal. So instead of my mom calling me all the time, um, I actually found myself calling my mom a lot 
as we saw this rise in anti-Asian American hate and violence across the country. Um, and then I would hear these stories from back home about, you know, a firefighter from upstate who was harassed as she was carrying groceries to her car and being called anti-Asian slurs and calling my folks and saying, hey, you know, just I want you to be careful at the grocery store. I want you to feel safe and be comfortable um, in doing that and going through kind of what you do every single, you know, every day. Um, and then in the town I grew up in, there was um, a gentleman who was just kind of walking uh, through the park uh, and he was almost hit by a car and told to go back to China. And I remember calling my folks and saying, hey, you know, maybe take fewer walks around the neighborhood because I don't want something like that to happen to you. I want you to take care of yourself and make sure that you're doing okay. Um, and realizing that at the end of the day, everybody, it doesn't matter what you look like or where you come from or what your background is, everybody should have a fundamental right to feel safe. You know, whether that's, you know, feeling safe going to school, going to your place of work or worship, going to the grocery store, even walking around your own neighborhood. And, um, you know, what we've seen is that so many Asian American families across the country have that same sort of feeling of not being safe. And so that's really why we got started is because, you know, we were curious about, you know, why is this happening now? Why is this anti-Asian American violence happening in such a prolific manner today? And also, why has it happened throughout history? Uh, because this isn't something that's just been happening over the last few years, but we saw it against, you know, members of the Sikh community after 9-11 against members of Americans of East Asian descent after the rise of the Japanese automobile industry uh, in the 1970s. And at the end of the day, you know, where we came to as a small group of parents, students, and teachers is that, you know, hate comes from fear uh, and fear comes from ignorance. And so as we've seen this rise in anti-AAPI hate, you know, we realize it's because that so many folks haven't been taught about Asian Americans and our role in helping build, you know, and helping build our nation. Um, you know, we thought about the late Bishop uh, Desmond Tutu, uh, who said at some point, you got to stop just kind of pulling people out of the river, and you have to go upstream and find out why they're falling in in the first place. And so for us, that meant tackling this issue at its root cause, which is that, you know, we want Asian Americans to be seen as full fledged human beings. I want folks like my parents to be seen less as not as foreigners, not as threats, not as carriers of contagion, but as neighbors and members of our community. Who are playing the same role that everybody else is in trying to, you know, make their life work. Um, you know, right now, API history, if it is taught, it's primarily West Coast based and it's primarily trauma centered. And so we wanted to move away from that because we wanted Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders to be seen as full fledged human beings that were more than just the trauma that we've experienced, but that our lives include so much joy too. That there are these incredible contributions around us that, you know, that we take for granted. You know, we, um, you know, Gutman College, you know, we're here in New York City. And, you know, there are so many tall buildings that went up in the late 20th century. And a lot of people don't know about Bangladeshi American, you know, Mr. Fazal Khan, who at one point designed the tallest building in the world, Sears Tower over in Chicago, because he innovated a new framework of tubular designs, because in the village that he grew up in, you know, there, there used to be all these bamboo shoots that were going up and he based it off of bamboo. And now because of his tubular designs framework, his innovation ushered in, in the late 20th century, a renaissance and skyscraper development that so many of the tall buildings that went up and that still stand today are because of an Asian American, because he came up with this, because he came up with this idea. Um, so really it's about changing about how Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, how we're perceived by others and also how we perceive ourselves. And so for us, it's so important to focus on localized civic contributions as that long-term preventative measure against anti-Asian American bullying and violence. And you know that's the hope that we're doing. We passed five laws in three states over the last year. Um, and for us, we really want it to be community-centered and community-led by the key stakeholders in K-12 education. Um, and that's a way that we're trying to change how policy is written and how folks are involved with their local governments to say, hey, you, know, you can get involved and you can have an incredible impact. Awesome, thank you so much. So I wanna shift back to Mahalio on the work that you're doing. So there, there are different organizations and oftentimes there's this expression around the, the viability of gender-based programs, such as My Brother's Keeper, My Sister's Keeper, with its focus on black and brown and um, different communities. So can you share your position on the social and emotional impact that organizations such as My Brother's Keeper can have, not only locally here in New York, but just in society with everything that we've seen happening in the news present day? Um, yes, yeah, not a problem. Um, 
you know, first, I just want to give a little bit of background about bro my brother's keeper, right? And, and ultimately, um, very similar to what Jeff was talking about, my brother's keeper is a call to action. It's a response um, to um, after the killing of Trayvon Martin, we saw President Obama call on cities, on towns, on tribal communities and territories, um, and across sectors, business, uh, 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 elected, um, and education to really implement or create and implement strategic plans um, that take necessary steps to connect young people, specifically young men and young women of color, um, to mentoring, to support networks, um, and to develop skills that they're going to need ultimately to be college and career ready, um, and ultimately to change outcomes for what our young people are currently experiencing. Um, and so for the question, um, my immediate thinking to the question is just to really ask ourselves, like, what is the social and emotional impact of being heard, seen, and affirmed? Right, um, because regardless of your gender or your ethnicity or your background, your location, I would argue that all of us know that the answer to that question would be that when my concerns are heard and acted on, when I'm seen for who I am and why I am, and that is affirmed not just in my school but at home and in my community, it changes what we think we're capable of. It changes what we think is possible, um, not only for, for, for myself, but for people around me as well. And so, the, and the truth of the matter is that there is a narrative that is out there. It is playing on repeat about who Black and brown boys are, um, which is frankly false, right? Our young men are not naturally violent. Um, they're, they're not violent. <laughs> Being black and brown does not make you dangerous, doesn't make you lazy. Um, and as long as these narratives are at play on repeat in society, in dining rooms, and behind closed doors, in schools, and legislative state houses, my brother's keeper is going to be here to do the work, right? And so, um, and, and, to, and to change that narrative, and I, I really appreciated what Jeff spoke about in terms of um, moving out of trauma-based approaches and, and, and really thinking about how do we change a narrative about and show and illuminate and highlight um, who we are and how we've contributed to society over long periods of time. This is exactly the work that MBK is working to do. Um, and we do that by by one, creating, right, recreating and redesigning and rewriting those narratives um, to present a different point of view um, by demanding necessary resources to level the playing field because we know the playing field is not leveled um, and to galvanize communities um, who have been impacted by generations and generations of the same song being, being played in their head about who their who their son is, or who their nephew is, or who you know their friend is, um, and how that friend is supposed to contribute or not contribute to society, um, and ultimately we think these three things end up shifting um, uh, and adding supports for our young men, which again will change trajectories, and and. The bottom line is that this is not just good for them. This is good for all of us. Everybody in society wins when, when, uh, when our young men are are seen, heard, and affirmed. And so, I'll, you know, I'll just stop there because ultimately the work of MBK is shifting that narrative um, and creating those, you know, creating those pipelines of access and opportunity to ensure that they are lined up um, and ready to go. I'll just say that'll preach right there, all by. <laughs> all. So, Jacko, I want to go back to you in terms of you talked about access, you talked about you know the shift in leadership, but I want to now talk about the work that's happening. So, you're fortunate, and New York is fortunate. I've arrived here, and there's so many community-based organizations because we are truly centered around helping individuals uh, have sustainable wages, emotionally and physically well. But when you think about the work that you're doing with youth and adults, uh, how do you believe your work will shift in the future? Um, I, well, I think that the, you know, the past couple of years has really uh, taught us that um, the, um, uh, racial um, uh, and gender equity work is continuous and it's, very, uh, it's also very intensive and we should be embracing that, right? That's, that's, that's one thing, right? Um, 
and working on, uh, as I mentioned earlier, working uh, on making our virtual and physical spaces more affirming. But we need to do that with more community informed programs, right? Um, and so that really means to give um, agency to the people who are impacted by these programs, right? Not just try and <laughs> impose programs and service upon people, but we need to work with the community to uh, make this happen. And that means that it means inclusion in decision making from ideation uh, through design, implementation, and evaluation of programs and services. So we don't know yet, we haven't figured that out yet, right? But um, my take on this, let's try to figure it out together with the community. And so for one, we have started now to do community input sessions, which will inform our goals for the year to come, uh, but also uh, uh, will serve as uh, input for a strategic planning, a planning process moving forward, right? So we, we will keep doing that as well. Um, I mentioned visibility um, uh, also a couple of times, and it was you know it was brought up uh, uh, several times. Uh, so that's also a very important aspect that will continue to have focus. Um, we started, for example, we started a working group uh, by and for uh, people of trans experience, and they're working on uh, a visibility of the trans community to really counter. Uh, the way that uh, people of trans, uh, trans experience are currently portrayed in the media, right? So they're working on PSA, social media campaigns, uh, go out in the street to do street outreach. Um, just a couple of examples. Um, <clears throat> another area has to do with intersectionality and um, the unique situation that people find themselves in. A one size fits all does not work any longer, right? Um, so it's, of course, it's much cheaper to implement, right? Um, I'll just give this one workshop to everyone, right? But it doesn't work any longer. Uh, also, people cannot wait because there are, you know, there, the, the people deal with uh, a, a challenge that need immediate attention, mental health, uh, finding uh, work, right? Or making, uh, making money to make ends meet. Um, uh, just a couple of examples. Um, so um, a personalized approach that recognizes the full person uh, that really includes one-on-one -on -one care coordination complemented with workshops, but those workshops should be flexibly amended based on the need in the moment, right? Um, <clears throat> one thing, another area I feel is uh, um, activism and advocacy. We need to do more work in advocacy, uh, perhaps even activism, but that also comes with a little bit of a conflict working in uh, a nonprofit system with the, uh, what is it, a nonprofit as, a, as an industrial complex, right? Uh, for example, if I criticize the mayor for appointing people who are openly, uh, who openly harbor anti, anti and LGBTQ plus sentiments, we run the risk of losing money, right? Um, but still an increased focus on uh, activism as well as, uh, of course, advocacy will be an important agenda item moving forward. And finally, I want to really uh, bring up uh, diversifying staff, uh, which is, a, which is, is a, a very important to us, but we still haven't tackled that either. Um, so staff and partners should be reflective of the communities that we're serving. Uh, and so people who are coming to our centers should recognize themselves in the people that are staffing the service, right? So that are at staffing or partnering with. Um, so we really have to hire and partner with people with lived experience, uh, increased peer-to-peer -peer, uh, work. And it's not, it's not sufficient anymore to say, oh, we tried, but we can't, can't find any people of color to apply for this position, right? The solution really lies into building trusting relationships with, um, organizations, businesses, educational institutions, uh, so that we have, can have a deeper reach for potential candidates. And I think at the same time, we need to, cre uh, to create uh, career pipelines that are upwardly mobile. Awesome, thank you so much. And, and I do want to uh, celebrate the work that's happening with the Brooklyn Pride Center, but also the partnership that they are endeavoring to form with Gutman Community College to make sure that our students have access I know our counseling and wellness uh, department has been in conversation, so we 
we definitely uh, thank you for the work and certainly we are uh, we encourage our students to be their authentic selves in this programming that's happening that's being led by our director of student uh, life Andrew Bennett so I'm sure that there will be some opportunities in the future Jacko to just talk about how we could uh, get our students access to many of uh, the programming and resources that are available so Nikita there's this return to campus so as as staff we we had to tackle uh, this you know notion of when do we return how do we return is it safe to return but the stakeholders that I believe were really impacted by that were our students who were in residential are on residential campuses such as Arizona State University and other colleges around around the world so one of the things I'm always curious about is that what, what is the shocking revelation that you may have observed when students actually return and would you define this moment as a return to the status quo program and as, as we know it, or do you see this as a time of transformation? And just what does that look like? What does the experience look like for you as the director working with these departments and now acclimating a student back to a residential setting? Um, certainly. So I think that there are a few um, um, experiences that have been really shocking. I think one is, um, this evolution of social media and how our students consume information. And I think that is interconnected with um, self-advocacy, um, activism, and leadership. And so what, what, what we really saw um, when students arrived back to campus, we also have to frame around the time. So uh, when students were arriving back to campus, this is, you know, post George Floyd. So every student, everyone saw this video on their on their mobile device, on their smartphone. Um, and then again, as we I think um, Helio mentioned, you students are also curating the 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 um, content that they're consuming. And so they are also seeing um, activists on social media. They're also seeing um, people act, um, advocating for themselves in a very different way. And so um, as students were coming back to campus, um, we saw they were like they were very vocal. There were some students who were really vocal and advocating um, that that there were certain needs that the university was not meeting for them. Um, and there were students who who were very vocal and why are we back on campus? And so so we saw this shift in activism um, in a way of one. Not only are they learning to self advocate for themselves, and they're they're using language that they did not use before. Um, and, and speaking about maybe what their needs may be around their mental health, their well-being, things of that nature. Um, but now they're also um, seeing injustice, they're seeing, seeing perceived injustice in, in, in unequitable resources and experiences. And now they are calling them out in a very different way. And so I think that that had been um, some of the most shocking things. And so um, the question is, do we return um, back to the status quo or, or, or this, is this a time of transformation? I'd say that we are always in a time of transformation. Um, every class of students is going to be different. They are evolving and they are transforming. And so as um, student affairs practitioners, we have to continue to evolve um, in meaningful ways that meet students again where they are, but also invite them um, to where we are, or where we are hoping to, to go. And so um, what that has looked like in a lot of ways is um, working with students collectively. I think a lot of students um, in, in, our, in my experience don't want, don't trust that, that leadership are going to get things done. Um, they, they want to be a part of the process um, and they really do tend to denounce those formal structures of leadership and perceived stru structures of power. I think Whereas maybe the millennial generation were um, a little more um, indiv indiv individualistic, um, this generation of students are more communal. Um, they want to make decisions collectively. Um, they also want to be at the table as these decisions are made. They want to be able to advocate for themselves and for their peers. And so I think in many ways it has caused um, you know, professionals to really think about um, how do we, again, meet students, but also um, create opportunities where our students see their impact because um, our students are again seeing um, these grand and great things on social media um, and they want those things for themselves but they also want to know that movement is happening that change is happening and as we think about equity as we think about those you know structures of power um, they can be slow they can be slow to move they can be slow to evolve um, our students are really in a place of um, you know that instant gratification that, that we have raised concerns about something and we want change now. And if it if it didn't happen yesterday, 
what's the issue and how do we make that happen? And so that has been, um, I think, the, one of the most shocking things, um, but that's also created lots of opportunities. Um, one, to not only um, continue to have some dialogue with students that maybe wasn't happening three or four or five years ago, but also um, in how do we prepare our professional staff um, to have these conversations, to engage. Um, and so where there may have in certain areas, of course, there may be um, a lack of transparency about our vision, about our goals, about where we are headed. Um, because our students want to be able to walk into any office and receive the receive the information they need, they need and the support they need, we really had to think um, across the institution. How do we cross train? How do we prepare um, that our students don't care that they are speaking with someone in health services or someone in student engagement? They are looking for specific resources. They are looking for specific answers. And how do we make sure that at a foundational um, level, all of our, anyone across the institution is ready to and prepared to meet a student where they are and to have those kind of developmental conversations. Awesome. I think Nikita is trying to, to age us on uh, millennials. I mean, I, I don't believe that I'm individualistic. I believe all of those things as Gen Z population as well. But I, but I take it that that's a good point that you're making. And you know, at Gutman, we're, we're certainly uh, seeing uh, students stand up and advocate for themselves as well. Even prior to my arrival, you know, there were conversations around George Floyd and how we show up and how we respond to that moment. And our college did an amazing job. So uh, kudos to the faculty and staff who, based on what Nikita said, we, we are certainly doing the right thing by our students to give them that agency and that voice. So I, I want to conclude the formal conversations with Jeff and I, again, I encourage everyone, we have about 15 minutes left. We want to spend that last five to 10 minutes answering any questions that you may have. So please place those in the chat. So Jeff, since the work that you're doing, we, we hear this whole repetition oftentimes, change is the only thing that is constant in life. And as someone is actively involved in policy formation, what advice could you provide the audience, some who may be, a, may be students, uh, to explore this pathway, what what must they do to begin this formal process of changing policy? Hmm. I think the best life advice I've have ever been given, and it ends up being really good policy advice as well, um, is from Tracy K. Smith, um, who's a former U.S. poet laureate, and you know she said that you know love is the most radical political act. Um, it is so easy nowadays um, to caricature and dismiss, um, even made easier by because of social media. Um, and it is so much harder to listen and empathize and build and bring together. Um, so I think my advice for folks who are interested in exploring sort of a similar path and heading into policy is get to know the people who you don't understand. You know, get to know the people who you don't usually talk with. Get to know the people who even might disagree with your beliefs. Um, and get to know what experiences led someone to be who they are today, because at the end of the day, you know, we're all humans just trying to make sense of this world. Um, so much of the older advocates I've talked to recently um, who have been doing this work for decades and decades and decades have mentioned how the political world has shifted around them. That you used to be able to kind of bully and push policy through if you were determined enough and you had enough clout. But nowadays things have changed and you have to do this thing called consensus building that the old method isn't really working anymore. Um, and through Make Us Visible, I've met with folks who I, you know, quite frankly, I fundamentally disagree with on many different levels. Um, folks who, when I first, when I first meet with them, you know, were wholly against the work I'm do, that I do and everything that I stand for, but then over time became some of our best allies. And because they brought new perspectives and experiences into our conversations, they actually made our arguments for the work that we're hoping to do stronger and our policy better. Um, so my advice would be, you know, don't dismiss anybody just because they're not an immediate ally. You know, if change is the only constant in life, then having a community around you who challenge you and better prepare you for that change, um, you know, that comes in and that puts you in newer and unfamiliar spaces, that's a good thing. You know, it prepares you. Um, make us visible. I mentioned earlier that we passed five laws in three states over the last year, um, and we've done so with overwhelming bipartisan support. Um, one of our states, we had 99 bipartisan co-sponsors. You know, everybody from the Progressive Caucus to the Conservative Caucus, um, you know, everyone in Democratic leadership, uh, everybody in Republican leadership. And the way we were able to get that done and to have that impact and change was that we went to the folks who we actually knew 
and believed would, would dismiss us. And we said, let's have a conversation with them. Let's talk with them. Let's get to know what their concerns are. And so I encourage everyone who's listening, who is interested in exploring that policy path to enter with an open heart to listening and understanding, even if, even when it might be frustrating to do so, Actually, especially when it's going to be frustrating to do so, um, to really seek out and engage with a diversity of cultures and beliefs. And above everything, to just get started in pushing your ability to empathize, to understand, to love, you know, whether that's in new spaces that you're putting yourself in, whether that's with the people that you talk with, the places you visit, or even in your own neighborhood and backyard, you know, be the person that builds and be the person that brings people together. I think that's a that's a great way to conclude. So I just want to again remind the audience that we're coming to a close, but this conversation really centered around three uh, frameworks, if you will, advocating for equitable outcomes for marginalized communities, shifting the focus of how we serve our Gen Z in different communities around a sense of belonging and connection, and then lastly, ensuring that minority men have afforded access uh, and the why uh, we, these resources should continue to be provided to our, our men of color and our different communities. So I, I want to thank again, Jeff, Jacko, Nikita, and Mahalia uh, for the conversation today. I greatly appreciate your candor and certainly for the work that you're doing. Uh, this is for the audience. This is one of three conversations that we will have over the course of the next few months. Uh, some may say, well, it was all men. Yes, there were all men, but there will also be all women in March. We're going to do a women's panel in March where we're going to talk about a woman king will be the theme. So that should be an interesting conversation. And then we're also uh, doing a conversation uh, in February as well, where we have great leaders. So I hope that you would join us. Uh, we will have the save the date if the team would bring that up. Uh, we have a save the date for the February event. Uh, please uh, look for social media to see uh, when the uh, next speakers uh, will uh, be announced. But certainly again, thank you gentlemen for, for being with me today, for the work that you're doing again, and certainly for the contribution that you are making not only to your respective fields, but just to society, because we can only do this through that collective impact of what much of you have talked about today. So again, join me in just thanking again virtually uh, these gentlemen for this conversation, drum majors for equity in education. Take care, everyone, and enjoy your day. Thank you.